So, in sources, we've obviously got the ubiquitous Blu-ray player that is now the leading edge in high-definition commercial uh, software. But, of course, we wouldn't be very good as a lab if we hadn't started with the Blu-ray, uh, I'm sorry, an HD DVD player. And in particular, I've had uh, various models since the beginning of you know, any of these formats and done reviews for various magazines. And which and model is that? And this is the, the current top of the line, or the last of the line, which is the A35. And so uh, I bought this unit in particular because I needed to be able to output 24p directly to the projector without needing to go through a scaler. Uh, and it actually worked. It didn't work the first time I got it. They said, oh, maybe you need to do the firmware upgrade. You know, hence my belief everything is disposable at this point. But in fact, one of the firmware upgrades did work. And even though there is supposed to be an HDCP handshake to the projector and so forth, we've managed to very neatly get around that. And the result is a direct feed from the disc digitally to the projector and then onto the screen. Gotcha. And then below that is the Sony PlayStation 3. Of course, naturally, is the alternative Blu-ray player uh, and is a much faster piece, but is a very, very complex computer and is not always the best uh, piece to use during a demo unless we want to have a lot of games. And games on this projector are absolutely insane to the point where, uh, with the press about the system and the photos coming out, um, Guinness Book of World Records called me up and, and is putting this in their 2009 edition as a room as the most expensive complex PlayStation 3 or video game That's console cool. in the world. And you just got to get a Wii in here. Uh, what do you have... Uh down below. I can't and see very, that. very bottom, we've got the Sony, um, I think it's the MCS 4000 Muse decoder, necessary to decode uh, Muse broadcast satellite, or in this case, the Muse LaserDisc. And below that is uh, quite an old Panamax um, uh, 5300, which really I just use in order to run things like the, uh, the cable modem mm -hmm. for, for the internet. And basically components which could use one little more level of filtering than going directly back. Um, so this whole piece uh, as such sits on its own 40 amp breaker and basically you know feeds stuff that, that has no uh, uh, real uh, quality issues Gotcha. in terms of the presentation of the system. Now this device, this was interesting when you started to describe this yes. to us before. So this is a uh, demagnetizer, like a tape demagnetizer, a bulk uh, video uh, degausser, but its purpose is to demagnetize uh, discs like PlayStation 3 games or DVDs or Blu-rays or HD DVDs and even all the way up to LPs and laser discs and 78s because a uh, small portion of the material, particularly in the label of the uh, modern discs, contains uh, some uh, ferrous uh, uh, component and as a result it does uh, get magnetized to a very, very small extent. And by demagnetizing it before you play it, it actually produces better picture and sound in a way which does not necessarily make intuitive sense. But the fact is, you know, laser light making a transition from air through plastic is going to be affected by both uh, magnetism and static electricity. And eliminating those using this device at this level of fidelity really improves the, uh, the experience. But here's my question, uh, because the, wherever it's going, it, it ultimately is looking at ones and zeros. That's true. So how does this let it see ones and zeros better demagnetized than magnetized? Well, it works like this. And this is specific to optical uh, playback systems. The, um, the laser uh, is an analog uh, light function. And the disk itself remains an analog function, even though it contains a digital signal on it. So when the laser... Uh, bounces off the uh, reflective uh, portions of the disc or uh, hits a uh, pit, which is really a bump, and scatters, there is a point of transition between the light signal being on and the light signal being off, which is nevertheless analog. You know, it has a, uh, a slope function, so it is not a perfect square wave. Um, the portion of the uh, signal which is affected uh, by magnetism in this case uh, will change what the slope of that leading edge is going from uh, signal to no signal. And the more that you can get that to be uh, a square wave, the more the jitter that's generated in the signal that you're trying to recover right. is lowered. So you get closer and closer to a theoretical ideal, which was whatever the uh, digital audio was at the time that it was very first encoded. 
but there is no timing information in, in modern digital audio. It's all assumed that you can recover the, the data, right. and as long as it's in sequence, you can clock it out evenly using a, a, a separate clock mechanism. And clearly, we've determined that the quality of that external clock mechanism makes all the difference, but it's influenced directly by the quality of the signal coming from the disc uh, with that laser. Gotcha. And in the case of LPs, you know, the uh, material that makes the discs black or colored uh, is very ferrous. And since we're dealing with moving magnet or moving coil cartridges that are in very, very close proximity to that spinning magnet, if you mm -hmm. will, demagnetizing an LP or a 78 does exactly the same thing, which is it prevents distortion from actually occurring at the pickup. So that the coil only moves when it's supposed to based on the groove as opposed to what the groove is laminated into. Precisely. Why, well, thank you. See, every once in a while I get to figure this stuff out. All right, why don't we fire this thing up okay. and take a look at some of the images it can create. There we go.